right hand of the Father. But to recognize that God loves you, Jesus loves you, still, He's still with you. His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is dwelling within us when we come to be believers. And that we are in Him, that we are in Christ. And so something uh, amazing, you're no longer of this earth, you are now of something better and something bigger. Amen. And so, sometimes the reason why we have a hard time getting to the place where God has called us to, even indeed where he has spoken over, said that this is where we are, is because our confidence in Christ is not yet built and established. That we need to spend some time building up our confidence. See, confidence in Christ, see, that's faith. Not just faith like I believe God will do something. I believe in who he is. I believe in who Jesus is. And so we need to, uh, how many of y'all believe that Jesus works on your behalf? Five or six of you believe that Jesus is working on your behalf. So for you five or six, may God really bless you today. Amen. So I was thinking about this thing about having confidence in Christ. And, and the Bible is littered with examples of people who had great breakthroughs because they believed, because they had faith. They had some knowledge and they built, and they built their faith with knowledge. Amen. I was thinking of the example of, of, of the man with the epileptic son. Do you remember him in the Bible? You remember him in the, in the book of Mark? And, and so the, the, the father says, you know, if, if you'll have mercy on us and, and, and heal my son. And, and Jesus said, if you believe, nothing is impossible. Remember that? And he says, well, he said, I believe. And he said, well, help my unbelief. All in the same sentence. He's, he's saying, I believe. I have a foundation. But build me. Help me in the place of my unbelief. There was a woman in the Bible that you may know as the woman with the issue of blood. Do you remember that? And her faith said, if, if I could just touch his clothes, if I could just touch his garments, I know I will be made whole. She had faith in Jesus. There was a man that we studied before, um, a man by the pool of, Beth, of Beth, Bethesda. Do you remember that? And she said, are you willing to be made whole? Will thou be made whole? And he allowed Jesus to make him whole. He believed. Amen. There was a story of two blind men on the side of the road. Son of, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus healed them on the side of the road. There was a centurion man in Matthew 8 that wanted his servant to be healed. And he said to Jesus, I too am a man under authority. You don't need to come to my house. I'm not worthy of you to come into my house. But you just say the word and I know my servant will be made well. Remember Jesus' response? I've not seen such great faith in all of Israel. And he says, it will be done according to your word. So there's a, 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 we're waiting sometimes for God to do some things, but we're waiting, believing, uh, hopefully we're praying, we're getting into the deeper things and, and really pressing and believing that God's going to come through. Anybody, you're waiting for God to do something in your life, faithfully waiting, not frustrated waiting, faithfully waiting on the Lord to do something in your life. And a lot of times, he's, he'll do it in your life, but first he's going to do it in your heart. Because your heart is more important to him. Your eternity is more important than your life. Do you know that? And so God will move powerfully in your life. Do you have your Bibles with you today? I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In the beginning of the chapter, Paul is sharing with the Corinthian church an experience that he had. He said he was taken up into the heavens, and he heard things that it was not lawful for him to utter. He shared this wonderful uh, experience. He gave him all the details or anything because the first thing he's saying is, I don't want to boast in myself, but let me boast in the Lord. Let me boast in what God is doing. And in verse 7, Paul continues, he says, Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above above measure. There's a lot of speculation around that verse. He said, he said, God said he needed to keep Paul humble. So he allowed a messenger of the devil, he said, to buffet him, to, to, to beat on him. And a lot of people believe that this might have been sickness in Paul's body. Others believe that because Paul, every place that Paul went to preach, yeah, he wasn't always welcome with open arms. Did you notice that? You ever read your Bible? What they did was they beat him. They challenged him. They beat him. They tried to kill him. But every place that he went, but yet he kept going to preach that word. And I believe that when he says a messenger 
of Satan, I think he means like an, an angel, a dark angel, went before Paul and created a difficulty every time he went to share the gospel. But he said, God allowed this. He said, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Is God's grace sufficient for you? He said, for my strength is made, weak, uh, is made perfect in weakness. Or strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. As much as you may face on a daily basis, is God's grace sufficient for you? We think about grace. We think about God's empowerment. The ability to stand. When God said to Paul, I'm not going to remove this thing from you. It's there for your benefit. But I, by, by grace, by my grace, you can stand. You, you, you can hold up. And so we ask, is, is God's grace sufficient for you? Are you looking to stand up and be strong in the current situation? Or are you looking for a rescue? Verse 10. The apostle writes, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Is God's grace sufficient for you? What is his grace? Power. It's God's power. His, uh, the, 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 the key definition is unmerited favor. It means that you get things that you don't deserve. It means that, it means that, that because of, of forgiveness in Christ, you're, you're starting at a level higher than what you would be on your own. That is the grace of God operating in your life. What is this grace? Grace is divine assistance to stand above the miry mess and to stand on the firm, solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is supernatural ability. Uh, in Christ Jesus, you're an overcomer. You're, you're not just a subject of a, a rescue, but that you're an overcomer. You're able to stand through the storms. It's like we sang in the song, when the oceans rise. You'll be able to soar above the storm, and you're able to, storm, uh, to soar above the storm by the grace of God, by grace. Grace, you know, like Red Bull, it gives you wings. Amen? Is God's grace sufficient for you? Christ has not only rescued you from a situation. He's empowered you. He's made you an overcomer. Do you know you've overcome some things? Sometimes we think we're going to be destroyed by things that are happening around us, things that happen in our lives, that break our heart, that cause disappointment. But by the grace of God, we're able to stand and to overcome these things. We're able to walk victoriously in Christ by this grace. There are standing seasons. There are rescue seasons. But sometimes we can become so accustomed to crying out for rescue that we miss the fact that we've already been rescued. And for some of us, it's time to move ahead. It's time for us to leave some old things behind and to recognize I'm healed. I am set free. I'm already up and above this. You know, when, when, when the, 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 the wind's coming knocking on the door, you need to tell them I've already, I've already overcome the wind. By the power of God, God is working in me. A few weeks ago, we are talking about being strengthened in the power of God, being able to walk in the strength of knowing not only who you are, but who is in you. What is the source of that strength? How do I, how do I leverage that strength? How do I, I grab hold of what, of what God's got for me? Amen. Some people have spent so, time, so much time being broken that you don't know how to be whole or you haven't yet recognized your wholeness. Doesn't mean you're not whole. It means you haven't yet learned to walk in it. Amen. And when we come to Jesus, we're made whole. We're made whole not apart from him, but in connection, in conjunction with him. We talk about having a relationship with, with God. See, that's what that is. It's a communal relationship. It's a communal uh, part of our existence with God. And that's what makes us whole. You know, once you've been made whole, if you leave Christ, you're not whole anymore. You're only made whole in him, with him, as you're walking with him. And so God wants us to have this, this place of intimacy with him. He wants us to be able to, to draw near to him in times when, when, when things are really going bad, things are really going hard, that, 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 that God, he's still there. He's right there. And so a lot of times we pray, so Lord, if you would just do these three things for me, I know I'll be all set. But God knows better what it is that you need. And just like Paul, he said, well, my grace is sufficient for you. I'll give you more grace. 
I'll give you more grace. You'll, you'll be fine. You'll, you'll be good, but stay humble, Paul. This isn't what, what Paul was actually facing. He saw heaven. Yeah, he, he was actually up in this place. He said, I saw stuff I can't even tell you about. I heard things that I can't even tell you about. But he says, it's not, it's not about me. A lot of times we see people doing great things. And we want to be just like them. But we don't realize that it's the power of God operating in them. And you can do great things too. Maybe not the same great things. But when the power of God is operating in you, you have the ability to pursue deeper things with him. But the most important thing is to pursue him before the things in him. Amen? If you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And in Hebrews 11, leading up into 12, it's a chapter on the heroes of faith. It talks about many who overcome, many who endure by faith. Some of these people went on to live very blessed lives. Others uh, went on and, and, and they died, as the word says, not yet having received the promise, but they died honorably. And they, they died obtaining a good testimony. And the fruits of their blessing were left for us that we live according to those fruits and passed on to the generations that follow. Hebrews 12, chapter, uh, verse 1 says, Therefore we also, <clears throat> since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Are you all with me today? Come on, let me see. Let me see. Wave your hands if you're with me today. All right. Y'all are too quiet today. I'm fixing to preach. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for your power and your presence. And my prayer today, Lord God, is that our hearts are open and ready to receive all that you've got for us, Lord, today. That, Lord, that we are resting and reclining in grace, Lord God. And I pray you'll open our hearts and open our understanding, Lord God. Make us hungry for the things of God. We ask you, Lord, as today, as, as we preach this word, that your word comes alive and it changes hearts and minds today. We thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 12, verse 1. <clears throat> the writer writes, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's a powerful verse right there. He says we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, of these heroes of faith. If you read through that chapter, you see everything that these people endured. That the, 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 the women, they saw their, their, their children raised again from death. And that they, some people had, had, had endured such uh, uh, atrocities, but they were, they were able to not leave their faith. And they held strong. And I'll tell you what, these are the ones that have gone on before us in the heavenly places. They're part of the eternal church. And so here he says, and, and he says, because we have this great cloud of witnesses, he said, let us lay aside every weight. You know what a weight is? See, he makes a distinction here between laying aside every weight and laying aside every sin. See, a weight is, is something that you may not necessarily be able to classify as a sin. I flipped through my Bible, and nowhere in here does it say it's a sin, so therefore I can do what I want. We can do what we want, but God's got something better. And there are some things that, that we need to lay aside. We need to be able to put that something aside. We need to be able to put it down so that we can go into the, 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 the heavenly abode. He, he talks about laying aside every, every weight. There's just things. I'll tell you, that I know there's some things that, that God speaks to me about that need to leave my life. It's not a sin. It's just keeping me from getting to a deeper place where I need to go. So we need to be able to lay that thing down, put it aside. And he says, and, and, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. You know what that's what he's saying there? In other words, don't willfully walk into a place of temptation. Get away from the things that cause you to, to, to disobey God, right? And he says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I'm not a runner unless I'm chasing something or something's chasing me. But one thing I do know is that if I, I throw a heavy pack on my back, I can't run as much as... As, as fast as I'd be able to, or as, as far. So just recognize that we'll put these things aside so we can run with endurance. The race that, that is set before us. Who has set that race before us? Well, God did. God has ordered our steps. We pray it every week. God ordered my steps, set the path straight before me. And so as we, as we are running this race and, and, and we're going forward, but yet we're still carrying all this baggage on our back, it's making it difficult. He said, let's put it aside. And verse 2, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
as he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking to Jesus. As we're running this race of life, we need to be looking to Jesus. We need to have a confidence in Jesus, the author and the finisher, the originator and the perfecter of our faith, of our very confidence. It is set in him. I think a lot of times that's why we struggle. We're still trying to do things on our own. We try to do it on our own and call it God. We, we, try to, we try to come up with our own plan, and then we give our plan to God and say, would you bless this? We need to go to God to get the plan. And then you know what? God has made you creative, right? Most of us. Creative. Most of us kind of got this, this thing that, that we have and that we do. But you know, you don't have to go to God blank. You can, you can bring your plans into God and let him perfect those plans. Let him perfect your day. Let him perfect your pursuits. Let him encourage you in the things that he has for you. You know, there's some things that, 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 that we have. There's ideas. Anybody here, you get supernatural ideas sometimes? Is, you ever enact those supernatural ideas and they don't work at all? Because you got the idea and you left God behind. You need to be with him every day. That's what this is, building faith, building confidence in God. It means that, that you are with him continually. That you're bringing, and, and you know what? And, and when you uh, uh, succeed in it, you know, you're, look what I did! They're not humble. Humblest, look, what, look, look, look at what God did. Thank you, God, for using my hands. Thank you for using my mind. Thank you for letting me be a part of, of, of the blessing that you're working inside of me. Man, if we could get this, if we get this in our hearts and get it right, then we recognize every day if we will go to God and, and joyfully giving thanks to God when things are working out all right. You know, sometimes I, there's so many different types of people that we run into. But we come into the kingdom of God, and some people, the only time they come is when there's trouble. Any troublemaking Christians in the room? Y'all bring it up. I'm coming to church today. That must mean something went wrong in your life. Other people, they, 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 they leave when, when troubles come. Troubles come, that's it. Can't be God. There's no such thing as this God. I don't know, because if he, he would do exactly what I want him to do. He's Lord. You do what he wants you to do, not the other way around. Now, greatest among you will be the servant of all, but you are a servant of God. Amen. And so God knows more than you. And God has a better plan for you than what you have planned for yourself. You know, it's not even to the heart of man all that God has for you. But we have the mind of Christ, the Bible says. But we have the mind of Christ. If, if we will go by the Spirit and, and pray and spend time in the cave with the Lord, he'll reveal his plans. He'll give you what it is that you can bear, what it is that you can, you can stand. Amen? Look into Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Do you, you recognize that? The joy set before him, he endured the cross. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? It means that, 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 that before, the joy set before him is, is the kingdom he's coming into. It's you, it's me, it's the children of God. That, that, that this, this, what, what it is that we have together with him. That was the joy that was set before him. So he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God. And verse 3, the writer says, For consider him who endured such hostility. There's times when we get weary. There's times when we get tired. There's times when you want to give up. And, you know, and, and we say, that's it, God. If you're not going to do it for me, then forget it. But the Bible here says very wisely, consider what he endured. Consider him who endured such hostility and that he did it for our sakes. He did it so that we could have victory in him. Amen. So let me give you my first point for the day. Learn confidence in Christ by regarding him in every situation. Learn confidence in Christ by regarding him in every situation. When I say regarding him, I mean considering him, considering uh, his will, his character, considering his word. You know, whatever your, your day is like, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, whatever season of life that you're in, if you're young, if you're, if you're old, uh, we ought to be mindful of God's words. We ought to be mindful of God's thoughts. We ought to be mindful of, of the nature and the character of, of God and everything that we set our, our feet to do and our hands to do, we ought to be mindful of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be thinking about him. You know, sometimes it's, you, you can kind of get out there and think about what it is that I deserve, what it is that I want to do, and I don't understand why God won't let me A, B, and C, but we're to be mindful of his nature. How many of y'all know his nature is a good nature? He's a good God. 
And he's good to you, and he's good to me. He's a good God. His heart is always for us, never against us. Things may not be going the way that we want, but we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. The word says, sanctify him in your heart and always be ready to give a, a reason for the hope that is on the inside. Any people of hope here? Yeah. I've got an earnest expectation in the things of God. I know that God's got better for me. Amen. Amen. And so we need to be able to keep him in our heart and keep, keep him in our mind. You know, most people, when life gets busy, when life gets challenging, the first thing that tends to go is what? Your prayer life. I don't have time to pray. I give them that 30 seconds between the car and the house, you know. And, and, and that can be where the pr our prayer lives tend to suffer. But when we, when we live our lives uh, with Christ, when we live our lives in Christ, we come to know him intimately. We come to know his heart. We see the work of his hand. And we come to the understanding, listen to me, we come to the understanding that we are loved, that we are blessed, and that we are cared for. No matter the situation, no matter what's going on around us, we're loved, we're blessed, we're cared for. You know, a lot of times we talk about the, the tough things that you might deal with in life, but you know, even on your good days, even on the days that you are, are most abundantly blessed, you're still loved, you're still cared for. You're still blessed. God is, God is with you. His heart is with you. Amen. We need to learn confidence. Learn confidence in Christ by regarding him in every situation. Philippians 4. The Apostle Paul writes this. Philippians 4.10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at your last care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, I love this part here. Not that I speak in regard to need. It's not that I need anything from anybody. He said, but I have learned. Paul said, I have learned confidence. In whatever state I am, to be content. In our modern application to that verse, I've learned that uh, life throws all kinds of stuff my way. And whatever comes my way, I've learned not to lose my mind. Has anybody here yet learned not to lose your mind when things aren't going right? I, I haven't quite learned that yet. I'm doing better than I have before, but I've, I, I've learned some things. And, and Paul said, I've learned not to lose my mind, and I've learned not to lose my confidence in Christ. And that is so important. When things aren't going right, it, just so many throw their hands up and they say, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care about me. Why is that person blessed and I'm not blessed? Don't lose your confidence in Christ. Trust him. You know, we, 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 uh, we're tested sometimes. How many of you like to be tested? People push your buttons. I'm testing you. God will push your buttons. He's going to let you hang out there for some time because some testing isn't so you'll fail. Testing proves you. It proves you. It proves that you're, you're ready for something more, that you're ready for something better. That, that when you're, you're, when you're, you're tested, it means you can be trusted. And when God will trust you, when God can trust you, not just trust your heart, but trust you to get things accomplished. Trust that you're not going to fall away. He'll entrust more to you. He'll entrust your dream. He will entrust you with the, 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 the things that are necessary, the resources that are necessary to get his work done. You know, trust in the Lord. Verse 12, Paul continues. He says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I, I love what Paul is saying here. He says, I've been on both sides of the coin. I've been poor, and I've, I've had abundance. I've, 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 I've suffered lack, and I've, I've suffered wealth. And I've learned in all these things, he says in all these things, I, I, I've learned I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've learned that God's grace is sufficient for me. I've learned that strength is made perfect in weakness. By implication, I have suffered lack, but Christ strengthens me. If we can understand that, what have I learned? I've learned that when I'm weak, God is strong. I've learned that in my times of weakness that I can go to him and he will lift me up. I have learned that when I back off, God will press in. I have learned that I am in, in a communal relationship with God. We, we commune one with another, with God. And this is where the source of our strength is. Not only... I can do all things through Christ. But it's that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
That means you have to go through some muck and mire times. That means sometimes you have to go through some fatigue. You're going to have to go through some, some difficulty, some dryness from time to time. But boy, in those times, if you'll press on with God, you'll see that God will strengthen you. And then you have learned, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's one of those really hard scriptures because people can quote all the time, uh, I can do all things, I can do all things, I can do all things. But there's a whole lot more to that scripture than just that. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That means you're going to be weak at times. But it's God who will bring you strength. Amen. You see people out there, you see singers, you see worshipers, you see artists, you see actors, you see uh, preachers, people who are successfully doing what it is that you want to do. You see writers, authors, businessmen, athletes, gifted and anointed. In many cases, they are wealthy uh, and they have learned through harvest and through famine that, famine that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. Not only can they do all things through Christ, but through Christ who strengthens them. By implication, good days and bad days. You know, I've looked and I've seen and watched some people that can really move out and do incredible things. And people admire these people. Oh, if I could just sing like so-and-so. If I could prophesy like so-and-so. If I could just run a business like this person could. You know, and these are the things that I want, but... You don't know what happened to get them to that place. You don't know what they've suffered and endured for that, that, that place of perfection that you might see in them. Are you willing to pay the price to get to the place that they got to? That's a totally different question altogether. You know, it, it's not just going to be here and hand it out. You know, think people just to step up and, and they start operating in this place of perfection. That's not the case. It takes time to build up, and you've got to work by faith. Amen. Whatever it is you set the hands to do, you've got to be able to do it by faith. In times of abundance, we give praise and we give thanksgiving. And in times of, of famine, of lack, we, we draw back, but we press in with all prayer. I like that. With all prayer and all su uh, uh, supplication. Isn't that something? Anybody here, you ever been through a season of lack? You got some crazy things that are going on. You got some finances that need to be met. You got, you got all of this going on. And you, and you say, you know what? But, but how often are we willing to press in and pray? For the Lord to really break through. So a lot of times, first thing they'll do is go to MasterCard. Go to Visa. They'll go to somebody to give them some advice and give them some direction. We need to be able to go to a place of prayer. And God will break through. But he doesn't break through the time in which we desire it all the time. There's a place where we have to come to a place of intimacy. And God will move quickly and swiftly on your behalf if you can get into that holy place with him. And I think that's a lot of times where people back off. Like just five more minutes would have done you just good. Just stay focused and stay, stay focused for just a few more minutes, you know. And I think, I think there's a regular, you're like this close to a, a, a breakthrough, but then you got to go check your Facebook. Your phone's got to ring. You got to get to your next meeting. You, 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 you got to go to bed. You got to get up. You, whatever, you got all these other things that you need to do. But what we need to do when we go through times of crisis, we need to press in with God. We need to set some time aside. We need to take some days off. We've got to do what we've got to do to get into that presence with God and allow him to do what it is that he needs to do. Sometimes we're not blessed because we're not, we're not ready for it yet. We've got impurities. We've got things that are going on in us, and God can't move us into this thing until he can clean us up and get us out of something old. Change your mindset. How many people you see uh, hit the lottery and they're still uh, wealthy? They blow that money fast. Some of you see these young NBA players and they blow millions of dollars in two or three years. They weren't ready for wealth. They're pushed out there too fast. They didn't have good advice. They're too proud to do things their own way. And now they've blown their blessing. But God's got greater for his children. Amen? With all prayer and all supplication. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we're encouraged to take on the helmet of salvation. We're encouraged to take the sword of the Spirit with all prayer and all supplication and with all perseverance. That we're not to take lack laying down, but we're supposed to address it emphatically and aggressively in prayer. When Paul uh, is agonizing with hunger or lack or suffering, grace brings Paul to his knees. Or grace will bring him to his feet. Because he says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. When Paul endures by grace, he's following Jesus. Jesus set the example and laid in the course as he himself learned his confidence in the Father through suffering. Jesus went before 
Paul. Paul says, follow me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so when Jesus is here and he's in the earth and enduring suffering, he's enduring stress, he's enduring opposition, even before the time of the cross, you start reading the, the, the Gospels all over again. You're like, man, Jesus really went through it with people. Jesus was hemmed in on every side. He was betrayed by just about everybody. And what did he do? He would escape. He would escape to the mountains. He would escape to a garden. He would escape to the wilderness. He would escape to a cave. And there he would pray and would go before God the Father so he would get his next uh, instruction. He would go to God the Father so he could be strengthened, so he could be lifted up and strengthened by God. Hebrews 5, 7 captures this wonderfully. It talks about Christ who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Those are such powerful verses. You know, a lot of times we picture Jesus praying and it was like, like a quiet prayer. You know, just, Father, bless me, these people. That don't sound like vehement cries to me. He was crying out, Lord, have, God, have mercy. He's, he's crying out and said, I don't know what to do next. you got to move, God. you got to do something. Father, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? This Peter, <laughs> Judas, are you kidding? Can you imagine what those prayers sound like? That's what I sound like when I pray. These people, Nick, June, Alicia, oh, God, what are we going to do with these people? The image cries. Seven, who in the days of his flesh offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. It wasn't just automatic, was it? He said his cries, Jesus, cries were heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He was a son. He was God incarnate. He, he, was, he, he was the begotten son of God. Nobody knew God better than Jesus. But yet he learned obedience through suffering. And having been perfected, became the author of eternal salvation to all who will obey. Sometimes we cry out, we're like, God, why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to deal with this? Because you too are being perfected through suffering. You, you too are, are learning godly fear through suffering. Anybody here, you enjoy suffering? I mean, you, you can rejoice through it though, right? He, Paul said, I count it all joy. But here, the, talking about enduring and going through this suffering, you know, that, that's a lot of things that, that, that today people don't like to suffer. I don't know if anybody ever did like to suffer. I think by definition, we don't like suffering. But the, the, the great lengths we will go through to avoid it. The great, great lengths that we'll go through to avoid it. We, we'll, but before we endure anything, we'll take a pill and see if that'll make it go away. You know, before, um, if, if there's any other way, God, take this thing from me, and God will say, okay, uh, you, you don't have to go to church today. We want to go through some deeper things with God. We have to be able to endure that place of suffering. You know, that's the very thing. A lot of people today, that's their, that's their, um, that's how they justify abortion in their mind. They don't want the baby to suffer. But God has ordained suffering. Great things can come out of suffering. Eternal things come forth from suffering. As a matter of fact, we have a right to suffer. Nobody has a right to take away my suffering without my consent. Amen? You know, see the value in these things. May the grace of God drive us to our knees or drive us up to our feet. Learn confidence in Christ by regarding him in every situation. You do not build up confidence in Christ by drawing back from him. We gain confidence when we submit to him saying, your will, God, your way. To render, we're building up something greater, but we obey when we say it's your will, your way. That builds up a greater confidence because he's working through us. My second point is this. We build confidence in Christ by listening to the word of God and following through. We build confidence in Christ by listening to the will of God, listening to God, listening for God's instructions, and then following through. We get our instructions from God, from the word, 
The Word is read. The Word is taught. The Word is preached. It's received in the Spirit. When you get it, follow through. A lot of times we, we hear things from God and, 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 and we don't follow through. We kind of leave it by the wayside. When you hear the Word of God, you get an instruction, follow through. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. Don't regard God's instruction as a common thing. It's not a common thing. It's holy. It's sanctified. You know, when God, God speaks something specific to you, that is, that is right from the throne room of God. This is God, the creator of the universe. And, and here's something. He's got a task or an assignment for you. And, 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 and we should jump. We should see that and really go for it. But a lot of times we don't. We kind of put it by this, the wayside. You get a word from God. You, God speaks to you. Don't just, just write it down and leave it in your Bible, never to see the light of day again. You ever do that? I flip through old Bibles. I'm like, ooh, I forgot about that. Pull out a suit I haven't worn in a year and the note in the pocket. I have written down in the service. And don't leave it on your seat or in the back of your chair, waiting for one of the ushers to pick up and throw away after service. Get God's instruction. Follow through. Get God's instruction and get ready to go to work. Wednesday night, we had talked about putting, our, our, putting some work into our belief, into believing in Jesus, the bread of life. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that belief is work, but belief is work. Belief is labor. Jesus said in John 6, 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That's amazing to me. I read it. This is the work of God, not the work that God does. This is the work of God, that you would believe in him whom he sent, that we would put some work and some labor into believing, not just that Jesus exists, but to understand him and every facet that the word of God has given us to understand him and to relate to him and to connect to him, to be able to draw. So when I say that I'm a Christian, what does it mean? When I say I follow Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, what does it mean? Who is this Jesus? And you know, if somebody asked you today, said, who is this Jesus? You ever think about what your response would be? Pretty amazing. But to be able to get to the place where you can explain that he's the begotten Son of God, that you can explain that he is God, that you can explain that he is the bread of life, that you can explain that he is the author of salvation, that you can explain, say, this is the Jesus whom I follow. And if you don't understand what all of that means, that's when you grab hold of these definitions and you get into that prayer clause of the prayer cave and you begin to say, Lord, would you reveal to me all that you truly are. I remember one time I was a young uh, believer and standing in a prayer circle and, and I'm, we're, we're all holding hands and praying like we used to do back in the day. Anybody used to be part of them prayer circles? And, and you stand there and you hold hands and stare at each other's shoes. And I remember looking down and, and whatever's being prayed, I'm not really paying attention. I was very young in the Lord, but I'm thinking, Lord, I want to see you. I want to know who you are. I, I want to experience uh, a, a knowledge of you. You ever prayed that before? And, 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 and right then, I had a vision. And a door opened up right in the middle of the room, just right in space. And I could see through that space. And as I looked through there, I, I just saw the galaxies. I saw stars and planets and galaxies and all these things. And I was like, Jesus was just then, here I am. And I remember carrying that around for a long time. What was that? I don't understand what that is. And I understand that Jesus said, I'm beyond your understanding. See, all of that, that's all of that, that's all me. And then begins a pursuit of finding him and getting to know him, getting to understand and begin to figure out my place in his universe. Totally different. Now, for me, that's, that, y'all like, oh, we know, we know. I didn't know. That was something that really opened my eyes because I thought God fit into my universe. It wasn't for me to fit into his. God is good. We get his instruction. We got to go to work. We got to build confidence, uh, getting to know who he is. So we have confidence in him when we know who he is. And here's something I thought was, was pretty interesting. This, this was a good point. I should have made this a point. But you cannot receive instruction from God if you cannot take correction from God. You, 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 can, you can never get the instruction without get, receiving the correction. So back in Hebrews 12, the Apostle Paul continues and he says, My son, 
Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges everyone whom he receives. That, that, that's a tough thing sometimes to listen to. But he says, don't despise the chastening, the punishment, the discipline of the Lord. Don't, don't despise that. Allow God to speak to you. See, a lot of times, this is where a lot of people are today in their Christianity. You know what happens? We become encouragement junkies. That means that we'll only go as long as the Word is making us feel good about everything that's happening around us. And when the Lord begins to speak to us and say, you need to fix something in, the, in, in, in your life, you need to change this thing, you need to turn this thing around, you need to terminate this relationship. When God begins to speak to us along these lines, we say, get thee behind me, Satan. Not realizing God's calling you out to something better. He's calling you to leave some things behind. He's calling you to change some behaviors. He's calling you to do some things differently. But it's the hand of the Lord. He said, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. And don't be discouraged when you're rebuked. In other words, don't be, I'm no good. That said, that said, I quit. Don't do that. He wouldn't tell you to do it if he was not going to help you do it. Don't try to do it in your own strength. You ever try to just break things off in your own strength? You can't do it in your own strength. You need God. You need the Holy Spirit, and that's why we need to pursue and get deeper into the things of God so we can understand and get to the place where he's calling us up to. God will make you new. God will turn some things around. That's why we all got together today and prayed over one another. God, open a gate. Open a gate of my brother and sister's life so they can come to a deeper knowledge of you. Verse 7, the apostle continues, if you endure chastening, if you will endure this correction, this, this discipline, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten, does not discipline? When God gets involved in your life, your dreams, God gets involved in your dreams, your passions, it's because he loves you and he has made a place for you, both in heaven and in the earth, that God has made a place for you and he's getting you ready for it. Verse 8, but if you are without chastening, of which all of you have been partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. To be a son of God, to be a child of God, to be a daughter of God, you have to be able to submit to God's corrective hand. And that takes grace. <laughs> it takes grace to be able to submit to God. You must receive the guidance and the correction from the Lord and recognize this, that not every denial, not every delay, uh, that these, this is not all opposition from the devil. May God help us to be discerning. May God help us to see the, the difference between the, 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 the works of the world, the flesh, the devil, and God. As sons and daughters of the Most High God, we need to recognize when His hand is active in our lives. Down to verse 10, talking about our fathers, our natural fathers, our earthly fathers. He said, when they indeed chastened us as seemed best to them. He said, in other words, when they, they, they beat us, um, in a way that was beneficial to them, that our, our earthly parents, that a lot of times when our earthly parents have corrected us, and they did it as best that they could, the best way that they knew how, but let's get real, it was probably very convenient for them to do it the way that they did. But here the Hebrew, uh, Hebrews says, it, they, they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, God, does it for our profit, that we would be partakers of his holiness. You must be prepared to be a partaker of God's holiness, a process of preparation for holiness, and we call that <coughs> sanctification. We build confidence in Christ by listening to the word of God and following through. The apostle continues, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nonetheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So in other words, when we're being disciplined by God, it doesn't feel fun. It's not enjoyable. But if you will endure it, if you will hold on to it, it will produce fruit in your life. It will produce the, fright, the, the, fruit, the, the peaceful fruits of righteousness in our lives. It produces something good, and we need this. We need to be able to hold on to the things that God has for us. Hold on to his hand. Hold on to his blessing as he is bringing us through difficult times. My third point is this. We demonstrate healing and maturity when we walk in confidence with Christ. We demonstrate healing and maturity 
when we walk in confidence with Christ. If God's given you victory in your life, oh my gosh, walk victoriously. There's so many people that once they get the breakthrough, they keep going around as though they're still destroyed. We need to give God praise when God breaks through in your life. When you get that breakthrough, when you get that blessing, when things change, and you need to be able to give a testimony. you got to testify. God has done something wonderful inside of me that I'm no longer what I once was. That should be a, a testimony on the lips of everybody in the room. I've changed. I'm different. Uh, you know, your, your old earth, uh, earthly friends, your old friends from back in the neighborhood, they're not going to like your change mostly. Because now no, either one or two things, either one, they don't have fun with you no more, or that you bring conviction to their lives because you are now a reflection of righteousness and they're not. But, you know, we got to give that testimony. God has moved. God's done it. You know, uh, many years ago, we, we could never do what we were doing now, but yet now here we are. That when I first came into the Lord, I, I didn't know anything. I just came in, and I, I, but, but, but God touched me, and that God healed me, and that he, he turned my life around. These are things that we need to give testimony of. You know, the Holy Spirit did a work in my life. He healed my body. He healed my mind. He, he saved me just in time. Let's song. Look what the Lord has done. If you have found your identity in Christ, don't be devastated when you don't receive the accolades of the world. If you found your, your identity in Christ, don't expect the world to stand up and cheer for you all the time. We've got to walk in victory with our head held high, focused on the things of God, focused on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, even when nobody else has given us applause. I'd rather have the applause of my Father in heaven than of a whole stadium of people. I'd, I'd rather have the whole room boo me and throw sausages at me. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather have the room do that than have God do that. Amen? How many of you would like to get to heaven and hear them say, boo! <laughs> I don't want him to yell boo in heaven. <laughs> I don't want to go, what's he doing here either? I don't want to hear that when I get to heaven. How'd you get in here? Hey, God's got high standards. Amen? This is something about, you made it! Praise God. I'm like, praise God. When the stress gets heavy, take a break. Find a way to deal with stress. Uh, stress is no reason to quit. I, 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 I got to put that right on the table. Just about everybody gets stressed out. So I think more people are stressed more of the time than they are at peace most of the time. But you got to let that stress go to work for you. You, you, you get too stressed, you got, you got to back off, but don't, don't quit. Do what you have to do to deal with stress. So that's the reason why a lot of people uh, quit uh, um, in their Christianity. That's a lot of reason why they, they, they quit in life. That's why they quit in their marriage. That's why they quit raising their kids, because they get too stressed out over things. And I'll tell you what, when the stress is that overwhelming, that's a good indication that you do not have the confidence in Christ that you ought to. He said, he said, he said cast your burden upon me. And we need to learn to cast our burdens upon the Lord and, and to let him be the source of our strength. I'll tell you what, when we're in here and we're praising and worshiping, you know, and it's more than singing songs. Right. You know, sometimes I stop singing and I just look at the words for a minute. I said, let me just get this. Let me get this. I'll sing it because I want to be honest when I'm singing to the Lord. Let me get these words in my heart. Let me get them in my spirit. And I'll listen and I'll say, now these are some good, good words. I could really worship from my heart with this. And sometimes it's like, well... I'm not feeling it, but you know what? I will. I'll feel it, Lord. I'll get it. I'll get it. Give me a minute, Lord. I'll get to it. And that's why we worship. Worship is a place of submission to the Lord, coming into a place of a, agreement with God. When our stress is of, of, of God, we need to be able to bear down. You know, sometimes God will put stress on you. He's testing you. He's challenging you. He, he's, he's putting some stuff on you. And you know, most of the time I found when I'm under stress because of God, it's because I asked him for it. I asked, I asked God, give me the opportunity. God, show me this. God, you know, sometimes like, God, help me win a soul and that soul will stress you out. But what do you do when God's the one that's stressing you out? You got to bear down. You got to stay in faith. You've got to recognize this place where you say, you know what, Lord, I know that you've called me to do this. I don't feel like I can do it, but I know I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. 
You start to back up. You say, you know what? I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I know how to be in freedom, and I know how to be under stress. But one thing that I have learned, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. To realize that, that you see, Paul said, I count all this joy. I count all of this, all, all of this stress. I count it all joy, right? And so to be able to get to that place, I, I, I count it joy because I know I'm called to overcome it. I know I'll be able to stand uh, through storms. I know I'll be able to, to, to stand when the, when the oceans rise. I know, I know uh, I'm trading my sorrows. I know, I know I'm, I'm becoming something different and something new. To be able to get that into your heart and spirit. And then you bear down. And I know I covered this a few weeks ago. But, you know, you bear down for Christ's sake. You say, Lord, I'm doing this for your sake. That this is not for me. I'm, I'm getting nothing out of it. But, Lord, I will do it for you. Amen. Man, God loves that. He responds to that. You know what Jesus Christ was thinking when he goes to the cross? I, <laughs> I don't want to do this, but I'll do it for you. Not just like us. I'll do it for God the Father. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. So God the Father sent Jesus for us. Love got him to the cross. Love overcame death. It's the love of God that operates in our lives. And again, come back to sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. God is not evil. He's a good God. I was watching this incredible video where there was a Christian interviewer who was interviewing an atheist. And their Bible knowledge on both sides was phenomenal. Phenomenal. And so they would use the same scriptures one to prove God and the other one to disprove God. And I would listen, and, and I, you know, June, I said, as I'm watching the video, I literally just went, amazing. And then they would argue, and, and the Christian interviewer looked at the other guy and said, amazing. I can't believe that you would believe. So, and then the atheist would look and go, amazing. And the three of us are sitting in a room, sort of, <laughs> going, amazing, amazing, amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I'm like, it's amazing. But as I watch this thing unfold, I said, what is going on here? This is chaos. What's happening? And I realized the difference was that one had sanctified the Lord God in his heart and the other one did not. One believed that God was good, the other did not. So the one who walks with the Lord has every advantage. The one who does not has every disadvantage. And we need to, God has called us to walk in a place of advantage. You know what that advantage is called? Grace. That's grace, walking in an advantage of grace by faith and by belief. We need to bear down in these tough times. Again, Hebrews 12, 3. For, cons for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. That's why we need to read our Bibles to see how faithful Jesus is and to understand different levels of faith as, as, as our capacity increases for knowledge. We begin to understand the faithfulness of God on deeper and deeper and deeper levels, the faithfulness of Christ on deeper levels than what we have before. It's easy to say he's faithful, to understand the vastness of his faithfulness. Amazing. Look what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 6. He says, uh, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? That was probably 90% of us before we got to church this morning. Right? <laughs> what are we going to eat for lunch? What are we going to have? What are we going to wear? I don't have nothing to wear. How many of y'all women went in your closet this morning and said, I have nothing to wear? <laughs> How many of you guys did that? Don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> well, I said, right, and, but but that's, that's actually a way that a lot of us think. We don't realize how blessed we are. You, some of y'all got closets and closets and closets full of stuff, and you want to I have nothing to wear. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to do, God, you don't love me. I got no clothes to wear. We're better than this. Did you just say that's me? Is that what you said? Oh. <laughs> I thought my wife just looked at me and said, that's you. 
<laughs> and it, moving on, right? <laughs> Verse 32 says, For after these things the Gentiles think, uh, seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, I want you to watch what just happened here, right? Don't worry. Jesus just said, don't worry. That's it. That's, there's your word for the day. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, that's, that's for the world. Those are for those who are godless. Those are for the, 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 the Gentiles, the dogs, so to speak. That's for them. Don't you worry as a child of God. Don't worry about it. What's he saying to do? Seek first the kingdom of God. Have confidence in Christ. Have come, walk with a confidence in Christ. Draw on a confidence in Christ and believe. And here it says that all these things will be added to you. You don't have to worry about it. It'll come. It'll come. And so sometimes it's, that, that, that's a great place uh, for you to pause in your prayer. I say, Lord, I know. It'll come. It'll come. I'm worried about it. Don't worry. It'll come. Yeah, but this isn't going to work out. Don't worry. It'll come. Everything that I have need of. The promises there of the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God. Yeah? yeah? And his righteousness. Uh, seek first the knowledge of God and then seek to be like him. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will come. It'll be added to you. In verse 34, general wisdom. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Or in other words, it's saying don't worry, uh, tomorrow's still going to come. Deal with it when it comes tomorrow because tomorrow the sun will come out tomorrow <laughs> you can bet your bottom dollar tomorrow there'll be sun because joy comes in the morning amen Like a few verses earlier, where Jesus says, Don't worry. Uh, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? You know, one arm's length to your height. By worrying, does that make you any bigger? Nope. Absolutely not. You know, I used to, I used to uh, have that saying that said, Don't tell me not to worry because the things I worry about never happen. You ever hear about those? Yeah, don't go by that button because this is worrying all the time. Jesus said, Place that burden on me. Take my yoke. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Cast your burdens on Jesus. Amen. Got to recognize, Jesus, cast your burdens upon me. That means don't try to carry it on your own. Who is your strength? Jesus. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He is your rescuer. That, that he is your, your, your fortress. He is your fortitude. He is, he is, your, he is your, 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 your encouragement in every season. That he is there for you and with you. And if you're not feeling it, don't give up. Get back in it. Don't trust your feelings, as a matter of fact. Trust Jesus. Don't, I, I just believe that the Lord is a, Don't trust your beliefs. But trust Jesus. Trust, trust in him. Trust, see, believe, set your belief upon him. Don't try to put him on your belief. You know, there's, a, there's, a different, there's a different dynamic when we begin to really uh, walk with God. You're called to be victorious in all things in Christ Jesus. And the book of Hebrews gives us uh, this encouragement. I'm back to Hebrews 12, 12. I love this. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight the path for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Isn't that powerful? This is after all the, 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 the verses and all the uh, instruction on, on uh, uh, enduring chastisement, enduring these things, where he says, don't worry about it. God's got you. So strengthen your hands which hang, hang down. Or in other words, you've been healed. You're not walking in victory. Straighten up. Walk tall. Tells us how in verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which nobody will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. If we understand these things, if we move forward in these things, we have a confidence in Christ. I'm going to close up here, Nick. If we can move forward in our confidence in Christ, we're not going to be operating on a higher level than what you ever have before. A lot of times we can get stuck. And we get stuck because we're still holding on to old things, old ideas, old paradigms. 
But you've got to believe that whom the, the Son of God sets free is free indeed. That he is that author and finisher of our faith. But we need to have confidence in him. And trusting in him. Not just a, a, a fortune cookie. Not just a very base level. I'll tell you what, the, the deeper you're called to, the deeper your connection in Christ will need to be. As we become more and more mature in Christ, it doesn't mean that we need less and less of him. In fact, as we get deeper into the things of God, the deeper the place of the calling of God, that's when you need to press in all the more. We sing that song, we have a great song, we, we sing, uh, this is the air that I breathe. And that may not be for immature, superficial Christians, but it's definitely for those who are called to do the works of God. Those that are called to, to, to impact this world, have significant impact on this world for Jesus. If we get this and we understand this, and we demonstrate our confidence in Christ, as we walk out as mature believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be changed, you will be transformed, your life will be different. Not every circumstance of your life is going to be perfect, but I'll tell you what, you will operate perfectly in those circumstances. God will use you as a testimony, as an example, that God will use you to set other people free. He will use everything that he has placed inside of you to expand the kingdom of God, that you as a living stone will cause other stones to live. That this is a word that is spoken over you by the word of God. It's for you. Trust him. And let me just close with this scripture. Out of Philippians 1, verse 3 and 6 and 7. Paul writes this to the Philippian church. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And you are all partakers of this grace with me. How many of you God has begun something in you? A good work, and he will complete it. He will perfected, that you are being completed and perfected even from today, even from this moment, that God is working powerfully inside of you. And you've got to believe it. Even if you can't see it, I don't see it, I don't feel it. What you see and what you feel is irrelevant. It's what God is doing and building on the inside of you, that you are made for something absolutely amazing. And God is working this out for you. Whatever it is that you've been holding on to and holding back, today is your day to release it, to let it go, to cast that burden on Jesus and allow him to lift you up. You are a peculiar people, that you are a chosen generation, that you would shout what praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into the light. Recognize this is your word today. Recognize that this is for you. Hallelujah. Let's pray, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we love you. We lay our hearts upon you, Lord God, today. That, Lord, that right from the beginning of this service until this closing part, the Spirit has been drawing on trust that we would trust you and profess our trust in you to know and to believe who you are, to know that you have, have sacrificed so much for us, but your love is poured out all over us. That, Lord, that when we have come to you, that you have come to us, that you are dwelling on the inside of us, that you are the source of our strength. That, God, that as we are dealing with different situations in our lives, we need not have confidence of ourselves, but confidence in you. That today, Lord God, we would humble ourselves as the Apostle Paul did, no matter how great the things are going on around us, it's not about us. It's about you, and it's you working through us. That without you, we are dead, but in you there is life, a life, an invitation to life, an abundant life. And we give you thanks for that, Lord. 
we honor you in this thing today. We say, Lord, today, we submit. Order our steps. Make wide the path beneath us, oh God. Make the crooked places straight. Allow us, Lord, to confidently walk with you today. We bless you, Lord, in these things. We thank you, Lord. So I want to I pray. And if, if you're here today, you say, you know what? Not, not everybody, but if you're here today and you're going through a financial crisis, I'm talking about lack. I'm talking about only way we're going to get over this hump is for God to break through a miracle. If that's you today, I want to pray in agreement over you, not that your breakthrough comes. But I want to pray over you that you would have confidence in Christ enough to bring the breakthrough. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand right where you are? Because i got to get through this thing. Any area of your life you're saying, I need that breakthrough, and I can't do it on my own, I know I'm going to have to do it in Christ. Lord, increase my confidence. Increase my confidence. You know, when Jesus spoke to the disciples, and he told them, you're going to have to love one another. You're going to have to forgive one another. You know, how often are we going to have to do it? You remember that scripture? 70 times 7. 490 times in a day. The disciples' response was, increase our faith. Increase our faith. If you had your hand up, just lift it up again. We're going to pray for that increase of faith today. Father, as we are here in the close of this service, Lord, I ask you, Lord God, for each one that is going through this particular challenge, increase our faith today, Lord God. Help us to rely upon you to humble ourselves. To humble ourselves and to come to you with real confidence, faith that you will break through. Faith in your word. Faith in your heart. Faith in your identity. Faith in your character. Faith in your nature. Faith in the will of God for me personally, individually. I pray God break through today. Let us see you for who you truly are and to know that this breakthrough does not come because of who we are. It's because of who you are. To know you. To believe. To hold on. And to do it for the sake of Christ. Glorified through us and in us. We thank you, God, for what you're doing today in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for the gates that have been opened over the lives of people here today. That, Lord, that we wouldn't just leave it aside, but today, this day, begin a fresh pursuit of the knowledge of Christ. A, a fresh pursuit of confidence in you. We thank you, Lord, that we are running the race and we are running to win. We're running for the prize. We thank you, Lord, for these things. We say, do it, Lord, today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is good. Let's give God a hand clap today. Thank you, Lord.